Hello viewers, in previous lectures we discussed four basic methods to calculate roots of nonlinear equations in one variable. The best approximation we used for the function in these methods was linear approximation for the function. However, a better polynomial approximation will speed up the convergence of the method. Therefore, there are some attempts to approximate the function by a polynomial. Here we will discuss one of these methods which is the Muller method. In this method, the function is approximated by a quadratic function or quadratic curve. So, we need three points on the function graph and therefore, we need three initial approximate value of x near the root. Let these values are x 0, x 1 and x 2. The corresponding value of function at these x values is calculated and suppose the values are f x 0, f x 1 and f x 2. This will give us three points on the function graph. Now, we can fit a quadratic curve passing through these three points. You can see in figure 1 on your screen the function which is rather drawn by blue line and the quadratic curve which is drawn by maroon or red line and this quadratic curve is passing through the three points with x values x 1, x 2 and x 3. Now, the next approximate value for the root will be the x value where this quadratic curve crosses the x axis and that you can see in the figure 1 the x 3. At this point the quadratic curve is crossing the x axis and corresponding value of the polynomial quadratic polynomial will be 0 at this point. So, what we do we just write the expression for the quadratic curve quadratic polynomial which we want to fit in the function near the root. From different forms of the quadratic uh, equation we choose a specific uh, equation which will be convenient for us in further calculation. You can see on your screen in equation 1 we have the quadratic curve given by the polynomial p x is equal to a x minus x 2 square plus b x minus x 2 plus c. As this quadratic curve is passing through three points on the function curve corresponding to x values x 0, x 1 and x 2, the function can be calculated at these three points and the quadratic curve will approximate or rather quadratic curve will represent the value of these functions at these three points. So, we will get three equations by using these three x values and these three equations can be used to evaluate the coefficients of the quadratic function a, b and c. So, we substitute the value of x 0, x 1 and x 2 in the quadratic equation and we get these three equations in a, b and c. You can see that the form of the polynomial we are using uh, form of the quadratic uh, curve we are using here gives us immediately the value of c. We need not to do any calculation, it is directly obtained because of the form we are using for the quadratic curve. The other two equations, equation uh, 1 and 2 on your screen can be used to evaluate the coefficient a and b by using Gauss elimination method. The expression for a and b are given on your screen, these are the expressions for a and b. Now, the next approximate value of the root can be obtained by using these a, b, c calculator recently and putting these a, b, c in the quadratic curve equation and suppose the quadratic curve passes through x axis at x is equal to x 3. So, we substitute x is equal to x 3 in the quadratic curve and you can see that since this is passing through the x axis the value of the quadratic function will be 0 at this point. Therefore, we will get a quadratic equation 
in x 3 minus x 2 as variable. So, we can solve this quadratic equation and we get the solution which will have two possible solutions as uh, the roots of the quadratic factor and to make this close to x 2 what we do we choose the sign of the under root b square minus 4 ac factor. So, that the denominator becomes larger this will make the difference x 2 minus x 3 smaller. So, we will be close to root. So, what you do you just write this form as you can see on your screen the next approximate root is given by x 3 is equal to x 2 minus 2 c upon b plus sin of b under root b square minus 4 a c. The sin of b will ascertain that the denominator is larger and the two values of x, x 2 and x 3 are closer. The stopping criteria is very much similar to the secant method. Here also what we do we calculate the relative error and just compare the relative error with the allowed error and if the relative error is greater than allowed error we repeat the whole process. The algorithm for the Muller method can be written by using all these uh, mathematical derivations. We have the expression for the coefficient a, b and c and to simplify the representation we define some more terms, more parameters as you can see on your screen. The difference between x 0 and x 1 is defined by h 1, the difference between x 0 and x 2 is defined by s 2 and so on. Similarly, the difference between functions is defined by delta 1 and delta 2. With these newly defined parameters the coefficients a, b and c are given by the expressions as you can see on your screen. Now, using these coefficients a, b, c we can calculate the uh, factor d which is square root of b square minus 4 a c and we can use it to calculate the roots of the quadratic factor. The algorithm will have step 1 where we will read the initial guess x 0, x 1 and x 2 we will calculate the parameters as defined earlier h 1, h 2, h 1, 2, delta 1 and delta 2. Using these parameters in step 3 we will calculate the coefficients a, b and c. With these values of a, b and c we will calculate d and x 3. x 3 is our newly calculated or next approximate root. Then we will calculate the error in the iteration and this error is relative error between two conjugative values of x approximate roots. We will check if this error is greater than the allowed error. If this error is greater than allowed error, we will take the recent three values of x as initial approximation and we will repeat the whole procedure by shifting to step number 2. We will go to step number 2 and repeat the whole procedure. If the allowed error uh, is uh, greater than the relative error we calculated in the next iteration we will print the value x 3 which is the root which is the approximate root of the polynomial. In this uh, algorithm we have presented a simplest form you can also include the sign of uh, factor d which is under root b square minus 4 a c to make the denominator larger. So, that the difference between x 2 and x 3 is smaller. The Muller method is a better approximation for the function but the computational work is much more than the secant or the false position method. The convergence analysis of the Muller method gives us a convergence factor of approximately 1.84, which is slightly greater than the secant method, but it is less than the Newton's method. For more details, the uh, viewer is referred to the website physics.arizona.edu. After this we come to another important topic in the roots of equations and this is rate of convergence. We have many methods why we need many methods. We need many methods so that the method given is suitable for the equation. The second is the computational efforts are made minimum so that we can get the result in minimum number of iterations. This is decided by the rate of convergence. In iterative methods we calculate the approximate root in each iteration and the difference 
between the approximate root and the actual root is the error in that iteration. The method will converse if the error in two successive iteration reduces with number of iterations. Suppose in nth iteration the error is e n and in next iteration suppose the error becomes e n plus 1. The general relation between the two successive errors can be written as e n plus 1 is equal to e n raised to k multiplied by some constant value m, where k is some positive number which is called the rate of convergence and m is some value which is smaller than 1, a positive value which is smaller than 1. If k is 1, then we say that the method is linearly convergent. As discussed earlier, the successive bisection and false position methods are linearly convergent methods. We mentioned the rate of convergence of Newton Epson method as 2 and we call it as quadratic convergence. The rate of convergence of secant method was obtained as 1.61. The secant method is better than the false position and uh, bisection method, but it is uh, less efficient than the Newton's method as the convergence factor for Newton's method is 2. The convergence analysis is uh, similar for all the methods and here we will discuss the calculation of convergence factor for Newton Epson method. For other methods a similar analysis can be done to obtain the convergence factor. In nth iteration in Newton Epson method suppose the error is g n and the value of approximate root is x n. In next iteration the value of error is e n plus 1 and the corresponding root is suppose x n plus 1. If actual root is a then we can write the difference between a and e n as x n that means we can write x n is equal to a plus e n. Similarly, in next iteration we can write the next approximate root x n plus 1 as a the actual root plus the error e n plus 1. Now, in Newton's method the next approximate root is calculated by using the equation 3 where we have the correction term h in form of f x n divided by f dash x n. You can see on your screen equation 3 which gives us the next approximate root from nth iteration we go to n plus first iteration. Substituting the value of x n and x n plus 1 in this equation, equation 3 we get equation 4 and after simplification we get equation 5. Equation 5 can be expanded by using Taylor series expansion the f a plus e n and f dash a plus e n terms can be expanded by using Taylor series expansion. So, what we do? We do Taylor series expansion of these two functions. You can see the Taylor series expansion of these two terms in equation 6 and since at uh, x is equal to a the function will be 0 because a is actual root the equation 6 will assume the form of equation 7 where we have a relation between e n plus 1 and e n. Now, we can neglect the higher order terms of the order of e n cube and higher order terms can be neglected from equation 7. If we are very close to root e n will be very small. So, neglecting this we get the simplified form in equation 8. Now, we can do further simplification of equation 8 and finally, we get the simplified form in equation 9. This gives us a relation between the two conjugative errors e n plus 1 and e n. Converting this equation to the standard form, we get e n plus 1 by e n square is equal to m, where m is of course, ratio of the derivatives of second order and first order divided by 2 as you can see in equation 10. So, if this m which is 1 upon 2 f dash a by f double dash a by f dash a is a small constant that means less than 1, then the method will converge and if you compare this with the standard expression for the convergence factor, we will say that the convergence factor is 2. We obtain the convergence factor 2 for the Newton Epson method which says that the method is quadratic convergence, the method shows quadratic convergence 
as we have already stated the false position method is having a convergence factor 1 whereas, the second method is having a convergence 1.61. We have uh, already discussed some idea about the convergence of second method and here we give some more details about the convergence factor of second method. The equation 5 in Newton uh, Raphson method for the convergence analysis is given by equation 12 for the second method. This gives us the relation between the conjugative errors in n minus 1, n and n plus 1 iterations. Suppose the root is a, therefore, we can write the relation between two successive iterations relation between error in two successive relations as given on your screen. So, we write this expression for both E n plus 1 and E n and then we use the equation for E n to eliminate E n minus 1 from equation 12. You can see that there are three errors in equation 12, but we need a relation between two consecutive errors. So, what we need to do? We need to remove E n minus 1. This can be removed by using the relation between E n and E n minus 1 using this relation for E n minus 1, the equation 12 reduces to equation 13. Again, we can substitute the left hand side in equation 13 by the expression for the error and that will give us a relation between the two errors, the same error on both side that is E n raise to p and E n raise to 1 plus 1 upon p and the constant on both sides can be compared and that gives us the value of constant k as given on your screen. So, comparing the powers of E n, we get a quadratic factor as you see in equation 14. The equation 14 can be solved and we get the value 1.61 which is the convergence factor for second method. Uh, the other thing is that f double dash a divided by 2 f dash a should be less than 1, so that the method will converge. Now, to start a method, we should be sure that the method will converge in finite number of iterations. Therefore, we need to do some analysis for the iterative methods to converge. Iterative methods use some initial approximation value for the root to start with. In each iteration, new approximate root is calculated we repeat the procedure till the error in root reduces to a given small value which is called allowed error. To reach the final result, we should ensure that the method will converge to the root in finite number of iterations. To derive the condition for the convergence, we can use mean value theorem of algebra. Let the equation under consideration is f x is equal to 0. The initial approximation for the root is suppose x 0 and the actual root is suppose a. Now, we reframe the equation f x is equal to 0 in the form x is equal to phi x. So, we can replace f x as x is equal to phi x. This can be done by a little algebra, little mathematics, we can do this thing. If this equation is satisfied by the root x is equal to a, we will get equation 16 that is equal to a is equal to phi a. Starting with initial approximation x 0, we will get the next approximate root that will be x 1 is equal to phi x 0. You can see the difference between 16 and the next equation. In 16, we have a on both side, a on the left hand side as well as a as parameter of function phi, but the in next equation, we have x 1 on the left hand side and x 0 as parameter of function phi because the two are not equal. Now, what we do? We continue and after n iterations, suppose we get the equation 17, the nth approximation x n is given by phi x n minus 1. Rather subtracting equation 16 from equation 17, what we get is equation 18. That gives us x n minus a is equal to phi x n minus 1 minus phi a. Now, using the mean value theorem, we can find a relation for equation 18 and it gives us 
the differentiation of rather the derivative of phi with respect to x is given by phi x n minus 1 minus phi a divided by x n minus 1 minus a. The variable j n minus 1 in equation 19 is any value in the interval x n minus 1 to a. Now, substituting this value in equation 19 what we get is x n minus a is equal to phi dash j n minus 1 x n minus 1 minus a which is written in equation 20. The equation 20 is obtained for all successive approximation for some corresponding value of a i for i is equal to 0 to n minus 1 and let m is the maximum value of the derivative in all these iterations. So, repeatedly we substitute the value of m in equation 20 and finally, uh, in each iteration you will see that m is multiplied therefore, finally we will get the expression as given in equation 21 that is x minus a is less than equal to m raised to n x 0 minus a. This relation gives us some idea about the convergence. If m is less than 1 then with the increasing number of iterations m raised to n will become small and finally, we will approach the root. So, the condition for convergence of the given equation the general method for roots is that m should be less than 1. So, m is nothing but the derivative of the function phi x near the root and this gives us the condition for the convergence. In today's lecture, we discussed the Muller method which uses a quadratic approximation for the function near the root. We described the method and discussed the algorithm for the method. We also discussed the calculation of convergence factor for different iterative methods and in this lecture, we discussed the calculation of convergence for Newton Epson method and secant method and finally, we discussed the condition for convergence for the iterative methods. Hope you enjoyed the lecture. Thank you.